Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Footy Travellers Podcast. We are back, and not just with a new episode, but with our World Cup 2022 series. Colin, it's also been a good while that we've been back stateside. Are you fully reacclimated? I'll tell you what, my uh, sinuses are relieved to be out of the desert air. I mean, Colorado's high desert, uh, super dry itself, but there was just something about that Doha dry that did me dirty. Yes, Colin did encounter a battle with the Doha dryness. But luckily, he's come out of the other side of it. Yeah, it was surely a battle, but a battle I was willing to fight. You know, if folks don't know who we are by now, just in case, once again, I'm Mike. And I'm Colin. Welcome. Or shall we say, merhaba. Ooh, Colin is already incorporating some of the Arabic words we learned in Qatar, specifically from some friends you'll meet in this episode, because... We've got Group C countries to introduce to our fine fellow footy traveling listeners. Colin, care to convey the countries we encountered in cordial conversation in Qatar from Group C? See what I did there? Yeah, wow. Bit of a tongue twister of uh, alliteration there. Too bad there won't be a Group M later on for me to respond with a, uh, a mouthful moment for Mike. Meanwhile... The countries in Group C, since you asked, are Argentina, Mexico, Poland, and Saudi Arabia. And do you want to give the folks a reminder of what we're doing with these groups? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, This is our third episode detailing our conversations that we had with people from each country competing at the World Cup, and we organized it as the initial group stages of the tournament were structured. So eight groups consisting of four countries each, and we talked to every one of those countries, to some extent, at least. That is right. And might I say that Group C, as a whole, from our interactions, again, not of how their teams performed, was incredibly entertaining to engage with. The variety of the four countries, the vibrancy of the conversations, the different walks of life we encountered, it might be the most dynamic group yet. It was definitely one of the most fun groups to chat with, you know, with Saudi Arabia being in this group, I'll give a little bit of a teaser and say that we talked to them, a lot of them at least, after that first game uh, that they had against Argentina. So they were hyped, they were stoked, and they came to drink. (laughs) Yes, they did. So as we share with you our conversations with each country, we'll give our interactions a score from zero to three, with each, each group having an overall winner. I mean, no one's really challenging us to change this random system in the first place, but having good structure is important, right? Hey, you know better than anyone, I uh, I prefer my structure. Yes, you do. And I love you for it because it makes this podcast hum. You're like the German mineshaft, the orderly among the ship. And I'm like the Brazilian Yogo Bonito, free flowing and detached, both very different, but together pretty effective, I have to say. You know, that's uh, that's an analogy I don't think I've ever heard uh, when comparing the two of us, but that's pretty spot on. So uh, yeah, well done. I don't, I don't disagree with that. Wunderbar. Well, without any further ado, everyone, or Mike's stretched analogies, the Footy Travelers Podcast presents to you Group C, Argentina, Mexico, Poland, and Saudi Arabia. Now, you might presume that being one of the favorites to win the World Cup, Argentina fans would be swarming the city of Doha. And you'd be right. They did come out in masses. So much so that it actually made talking with them a little challenging. You know the herd mentality. You know, you kind of stick to your own and do your own thing as a group. That is true. But there was also another challenge we faced when trying to strike up conversations with Argentinian fans. A lot of them are not from Argentina. Now, some might call them being fair weather fans or bandwagoners, but I found that this World Cup specifically had the most, in my experience, 
non-native fans, with Argentina being one of them. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, if we're just talking about uh, the numbers of Argentina fans that we saw wearing a Argentina jersey or a Messi shirt, uh, and then talking to them and realizing that they were from the Indian subcontinent or somewhere else in the world, not Argentina, that was uh, pretty prevalent. I wouldn't go as far to say that Middle Eastern or Arab countries had a strong representation across the powerhouse football countries like Brazil, Portugal, Spain, Germany, and of course, Argentina. But it did seem like part of this World Cup was for people to watch the two goats compete in perhaps their last World Cups, Messi and Ronaldo. Yeah, not uh, not any goats that you would see on the farm or, or eat. <laughs> But yeah, you know, finding people in the La Albi Celeste blue and white striped jerseys, uh, it wasn't hard to come by, but it was hard to find those who were actually from Argentina. Not to mention, when we did meet Argentinians, many of them didn't feel comfortable talking to us. Perhaps it was because of our FTP jerseys looking somewhat like their rival Brazil's, perhaps because we were speaking English. And perhaps they didn't feel comfortable with a microphone or a camera on them. Maybe it was all of the above. Yeah. You know, we did struggle a little bit to break through with the Argentinian fan base, I think is what we're, what we're getting at. And rightfully so. They are a little intimidating, if I'm going to be honest. If they are out in public, they are typically singing and dancing and keeping among themselves. Fortunately, we were able to wrangle one Argentinian uh, within Sukhwakif to answer one very simple polling question we were asking anyone we saw in the area, which was Messi or Ronaldo. Excuse me, excuse me, Messi or Ronaldo? Messi, Messi, of course. When asking if we could talk to him some more, he immediately said, no, 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 and pointed us to his friend instead. A guy wearing nothing to identify him as an Argentinian, but rather wearing the traditional Qatari headdress called a gutra and long white thobe you see in everyday Qatar. But we did quickly find this friend was Argentinian and just wearing the regular tire of the country he was in. And so then, Mike, you, uh, you tried talking with him. What was his deal? He, too, was very timid to speak with us. I believe he mentioned English, so I sort of assumed he didn't feel comfortable speaking much English to us. Once again, I wish my Spanish was better so I could have had a more meaningful conversation with him. But I said I had one simple question for him. It seems like okay. I have one question for you. Okay, which one? Okay. Did you bring a mate cup to mate. this trip? No, we, we didn't. Why not? Why not? Because I don't know. I see here is very hot. Yes. Impossible. Okay. Have it yeah. here. Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. And if we're going to ask any question of an Argentinian, I'm glad we got to ask this one. I don't know if people saw if there was a, a big article in the New York Times about the the Herba Mate being transported, being shipped uh, with some of the South American teams. And, you know, I think Ecuador brought like, I'll call it you know, 250 pounds. And, you know, Brazil might have traveled with 500 some pounds. And then it gets to Argentina and how much they had traveled with. And it was over a thousand pounds uh, of Mate tea. So... We didn't get a great interaction with our Argentina friends overall, uh, but we did get one of our fellow footy travelers fan questions answered. So we'll chalk it up as a, a small victory. We'll take what we can get. So what do you think score wise for Argentina? I mean, it, you know, it can't be a zero. We, we did make a, some sort of connection. Certainly not a three. I guess if I'm being honest, you know, I think a one would be an appropriate score here. I think that's fair. Let's just hope that our conversations with the rest of the group were a little bit more exciting. Uh, I have a strong suspicion that they will be. Moving on to our friendly neighbors to the south and co-hosts of the World Cup 2026, Mexico. Mike, you spent some time with a lovely couple from Mexico at one of our local hotspots in our Um Gualina neighborhood. Shout out to the guys at Green Tea, by the way. Always banging out some really good paratas, even at 4 a.m. So tell us about your interaction with uh, these folks. Now, I have to give Colin here the assist on this one. He started chatting with this couple while they were waiting for their food at Green Tea after a very late night of drinking. I believe nature might have called and Colin needed to head back to the apartment before getting to chat further with the couple. So I jumped in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, 
when you got to go, you got to go. Uh, a lot of drinking throughout the day and a full bladder. No one wants that, uh, that UTI. <laughs> but I'd like to consider this more of me just you know, tagging you in and putting you on the spot after being a touch on the drunker side to uh, you know, just see how you'd perform. This is true. I tend to enjoy my deep, introspective conversations a little bit more when I've had a few drinks. So thank you for the, uh, the tag in. And this instance was no different. I met Raul and Nina at about 3 a.m. And they were waiting on some late night food, similarly to me. And so I picked up the conversation from Colin as they were talking about how Raul and Nina, who are from Mexico City, had tried some really good seafood while in Qatar, something Colin and I hadn't experienced yet. And Raul mentioned they found it in the culinary rich neighborhood of Qatar. So what happened there, we were looking for something more authentic. So we found this, this nice restaurant. And when we were there, they give us the option to present different kind of fishes. And we're looking spe- specifically for um, uh, fishes from, from this area, for the Persic. And um, they chose two of them, and then they said that uh, they usually grill them, they, pour, they, they add uh, kind of a, a specific oil, and some species from, from the Arabic uh, style. And then, uh, then you can add some streams as well from, from the region. It's uh, fantastic, we really love it. And uh, I would strongly recommend to go to this place. Even the atmosphere is, is, is great. You really feel back on time, like a middle age with this kind of food there. Colin, you visited Qatar the day I left Qatar for Abu Dhabi. Did you get to try any seafood while you were there? You know, I didn't actually. Um, try to set out on my little adventures with a full stomach. So I probably stopped at a green tea or some other parata and tea shop. Uh, but when I did get there, there was certainly a lot of seafood available. You know, they had this little makeshift market set up between the promenade and the beach there, um, selling a lot of kitschy, knickknacky stuff. But also there was this line of tables with locals just selling a bunch of different uh, food and drink options. So saw some uh, oysters being shucked, saw some squid being laid out to dry. Uh, Certainly smelled like squid, at least. (laughs) But uh, yeah, you know, next time, got to hit up the seafood in Katara, I guess. If oysters are shucked, does squid being hung to dry have a particular word? I I wonder if that's a thing. I don't know. Something we'll have to look into later. Squid lead her, Squidward. I don't know. There we go. Nailed it. I have no. I think I that's it. No if it doesn't exist, if it doesn't exist, it now does. So just call up Webster's copyright. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, my conversation with Raúl progressed into football, of course, as he mentioned his favorite experience uh, for, of a World Cup was South Africa, like what you and I have mentioned as being perhaps our favorite World Cups so far as well. Well, what I think is South Africa. Even we were in Russia, but uh, but I think South Africa was the, the more exotic place because it was far in terms of flying there, but as well the experience to be, uh, you know, with uh, with all the things that happened in South Africa. There, right? You know, the upper hay and all these things. So it was was very very nice. A very you know, it really touched my heart, uh, South Africa, in, in that way. I gotta know. Did you ask them if they remembered one of our favorite goals from that World Cup? Uh, and really, probably one of our favorite goals from any World Cup. You mean that screamer from my boy, Sapiwi? I sure did. It didn't go over too well, considering it was against Mexico. But, you know, I had to give that a shout. Yeah, sorry, Mexico. But it was the first goal of the Footy Travelers World Cups. So memorable for us, for sure. So since I've been to Mexico a few times recently... But sadly, not Mexico City. I had to get some recommendations from Raul about what the locals call the F or Chilango. Yo, I strongly recommend to go downtown. We call this El Zocalo. So you can go and visit uh, the three main pieces of the Mexican culture. You can see the Aztecs. You can see the, you know, the Spanish when they settle down. And then the New Mexico, right? So you can really test three different big pieces of the Mexican history in the Zocalo, so it was for sure one. The second one is if you are more fancy guy, go to La Condesa. It's a very nice place with a lot of restaurants and good bars, good music. You will be really surprised about uh, La Condesa. And of course, the third one will be Teotihuacan, where you have the pyramids for the sun and the moon. Mike, you know I'm going to ask this too, you know, did you get to talk food with him? Of course, amigo. I wouldn't leave that question off the list in your absence. What should we eat 
if we were to go to Mexico or Mexico City specifically? You know, other people go with tacos and all these kind of things, but I, I will say, you know, uh, if you want to be a little bit more authentic, try enchiladas and ask for mole because this is the best way to test, you know, Mexican flavor. Uh, it will, you will be really surprised. You can, you know, have very spicy or not so spicy, but the mole for me is the most authentic food for, for, for Mexico City. Well, may I say muchas gracias por la pregunta sobre la comida. De nada, mi hambriento amigo. Solid. Solid Spanish. <laughs> so you talked travel with Raul and Nina uh, and a little bit of footy, you know, as far as the game goes. But what about kind of the, the combination there, you know, footy travel and, and footy culture and just really culture in general? I don't know. Yeah, this is this is where I got a bit deep. And, and, and speaking of the food, I mean, I was very much so eating it up. Uh, I love a good reflective conversation, especially about soccer. And so Raul and I started talking about the development of soccer and what it looks like in America. He mentioned how different the Mexican culture is when it comes to the soccer systems, but even the broader systems in Mexico, like education. He said, while in private school, he, like many others, didn't have an option on what they could do or what, what they wanted to do in school or even sometimes in their own careers. And you can put this in different contexts, right? Talk about music. When we were in the school, even I was in a private school, but because in Mexico there is a big difference between public and private. I was in a private school, you just talk about music, I didn't have an option. I had to play the flute. Everybody had to play the flute. Uh, my nephew, she's, she's living in, in Texas, so she went to the school, regular school, public school, uh, and they asked her, you know what, this is what you want to play. And then that's, they put in a different context, right? Maybe she will be successful or not, but she, the, 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 the option that they're giving you, I want to play guitar, I want to play Curry, piano, yes. whatever. Saxophone. That option is amazing, because then, it put your time at a different level. If you put the same in terms of export, okay, you want to swim, you want to run, you want to buy, you want to, and, and you, can, you want uh, football, you want tennis, that's, but that's an option that you don't have. And I think this, this, to, this to give you that kind of mentality and put it in a different context. In terms of um, you find your own, right? You, you can find your own talent and then expose your time that way, right? And, and, and I think that's amazing, right? Because then you have the, the right training. Maybe, maybe I can be a baseball guy, right? But only because I don't have options. Yeah, yeah. I have to have soccer. But maybe soccer is not, uh, I don't feel it. I want to play volleyball. The same way for football, right? So you are forced to, to, to follow different channels. So. But we don't have that structure. So that you said is, you have entirety, but as well, we, we are limited in terms of the options that the government is providing to us. Hmm, that's, uh, that's very interesting. And, uh, Maybe not totally different than some aspects of American life, no? Right. But I do think what he was getting at is more so the system and government being more determined to have highly dedicated and specifically skilled people in the workforce. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. Did they have more specifics about that? They did. We, we went into that. He and Nina went on to talk about how that sort of translated to their own professions um, when he was in school, he wanted to study history, but he, he was told that wasn't a good career choice. When I was younger, you know, and I had to decide what would be my career plan, I said, I would like to be, I would like to study history. I want to dedicate my life to history. You know, the answer I was getting, not only from my parents, but, you know, the people who was trying to give me directions is, you're going to be poor. You will not be able to, to you know, to have money. So you have to be an engineer or something. At the end, I am, a, I am an engineer now. But if you ask me, my, my, if, I, if, if I remember my, those days, I said, oh my gosh, I should have gone in this direction. I would be so happy going deeper in history. And my wife is the same, right? You end up doing accounting. accounting. Because yeah, people because say, like, you, you always want a job. That's true. But no yeah. one likes accounting. <laughs> yeah. No one's passionate yeah. about accounting, right? Yeah, yeah, no. uh, ended up but doing so something true. different, but yeah. anyway. We then talked about soccer and how beautiful it is in our own respective countries. To be honest, I love soccer. And you know, I learned soccer by myself, right? Because we were playing in the streets. That's why it's so popular. Yes, even if you are getting yeah. it's even worse than us in that way, right? Or Brazil, Brazil. they play in the beach. Yeah. But yeah. you, you have it. Right? I, mean, no I also played, I have an uh, older brother, one year older, so I was... Yeah. 
his little brother. Yeah. So I had to play with him uh, everything. Baseball, football, soccer. Yes. So that's why sure. I started. Yeah. Um, so yeah. We never had a ball. We never right. had proper yeah. shoes. We had just a ball uh, and yeah. two uh, stones. That would be uh, our... But that's the beauty of the, uh, the soccer down yeah. Mexico. For real, that's why it's so popular. It's right. so simple and so cheap. Like. Finally, we talked about what we thought about the success of soccer in America. Since as co-hosting countries, we have a vested interest in the success of the sport in both the U.S. and Mexico now. Yeah. Uh, let's see what happens in the next World Cup because, you know, right? it will be great to see how Canada continue going and you guys, you have a lot of times and let's see what happens in four years. Right. Messi has a lot, of, a lot of things to do in these four years. Yes. Wow, dang man. Sounds like you got a lot out of that conversation. Sorry I had to go answer nature. <laughs> a lot of great topics, a lot of great insight into the Mexican culture, travel, expectations for 2026. You know, who thought waiting for late night food could be so fulfilling? And you know, the icing on the cake, as we were walking out, as a way of saying thanks, they decided to give me a traditional luchador mask as a gift. Oh, I remember that mask. You came running into the apartment with it on your face like a uh, kid on Christmas morning. He just got his very own Chewbacca mask. <laughs> this mask is far, far better than a Chewbacca mask, my friend. Is it a galaxy far, far away better? If only I could do the Chewbacca sound effect right here, I would. But instead, I'll say this convo with Raul and Nina was Hans Solamente Mi Favorito Hasta Aquí. Okay. Well, there you have it, friends. Mike has brought not only his alliteration back from Qatar, but also his puns. It's good to have you back, buddy. Pleasure to be here, Colin. So let's get a grade for your Mexico interaction. What are you? Three. Three. Three, three. Three, hands down. Three. Wow. Just that definitive. Yep. I loved everything about the conversation. The people, the atmosphere we were in, and my very thoughtful present. Thank you, Raul and Nina. See you in 2026, my friends. That brings us to Poland. We had the pleasure of meeting a lovely trio from Poland at the very fun and very loud FIFA Fan Fest following a massive victory for the White Reds also nicknamed the Eagles. Welcome to the Hotel California. No, not, not those Eagles. Not those Eagles either. Thank goodness. Don Henley and Don McNabb are not my favorite. <laughs> we are talking about, instead, the Polish Eagles, led by goal-scoring legend Robert Lewandowski. And we caught up with Martik, Jana, and Lucas just hours after their country's victory over Saudi Arabia. And they were fairly easy to spot in the fan fest, dressed in red and white. But I'll admit, there are a lot of teams in this tournament in red and white. And the Polish crest looks similar to others from far away. Yeah, we had to chase this group down a bit in the uh, sea of fans there to watch the Argentina versus Mexico match. We first asked Martik if this was his first World Cup, and he said it was, and then mentioned that he traveled to, I believe, the Ukraine for the 2012 Euros, but here's how he described it, and you'll see why I say that with a little little confusion. Yeah, it's my first World Cup. I was in the Masters of Europe in Poland in Ukraine in 2012. 2012, nice, okay. What is the farthest... people are here! What's the farthest you've traveled to support Poland? For game? Yeah. Yeah, for game. Yeah, it's, it's my farthest way. Okay. I never nice. be far. All right. Yeah, not only was it challenging to hear anything with the FanFest MC shouting in the background, but also Martek's accent was a bit strong, but I loved his answer to the next question. Yeah, we asked him who he thought was the best Polish football player ever. Uh, lots of... Uh... People say that uh, Lata because he scored the most goal of World Cup for our national. Okay. What was his name one more time? Uh, Lato. Lato. Lato is the surname. Okay. Uh, he was uh, probably one times the best uh, striker or something nice. in the past. 
Now, I honestly had to look this guy up because I had never heard of him. I mean, he, he's kind of quite the legend. A few very impressive stats of his to reel off to you. FIFA World Cup Golden Boot 1974, where Poland finished third. FIFA World Cup All-Star Team that same year. Polish Footballer of the Year 1977 and 1981. Olympic gold medal in 1972 and silver medal in 76, 100 caps and 45 goals. Sounds like he was uh, Robert Lewandowski before there was a Robert Lewandowski. Only difference is Lato scored in the World Cup. <sighs> Ooh, sorry, Lua. I mean, Lua did get two goals in this World Cup. Finally, finally got his goals. So maybe pump the brakes there. Now, my favorite answer that this group gave was to one of my questions. What do I need to do or see? What's the best thing about Poland? The best thing? Yeah. Uh, you need to drink vodka. Yeah. <laughs> With Polish people, of course. <laughs> With Polish people, of course. Obviously, yeah. This sounds enjoyably similar to our Russian friends we met in Moscow back in 2018. Or really anywhere in Russia, honestly. They want to drink vodka. And they want to drink vodka with you. So I'm for it. Yeah, sounds like we, uh, we have to visit now. Lastly, we had been asking a fun fill-in-the-blank question for people that we talked to. And I thought these three gave a nice range of answers. Poland is the best team tonight. All right. And beautiful. And beautiful. And fantastic people. There you go. So... If you're looking for a reason other than vodka to visit Poland, there you have it. Fantastic people uh, that score goals in international matches, Mike. People that drink lots of vodka. Uh, people that enjoy traveling for football and have a great time really just doing all of that. And maybe, having mentioned travel, Jana actually chatted with us about a side trip she made on her way to Qatar via Istanbul. So she visited the world-famous Hagia Sophia, and, you know, I'm probably saying that wrong as well, but... It's Hagia Sophia. Shh, shut up, Mike. <laughs> Sorry. She gave a small piece of advice through perhaps a more embarrassing moment. What was it like for you? Uh, actually, it was uh, quite different than I saw in our church, so in Christian church. Uh, it was empty and it was quite... Uh, quite surprising for me, but uh, the building itself is beautiful, really. Uh, it's something wow. But uh, in front of the Hagia Sophia is another uh, mansion, ma mask, yeah. And uh, it was also huge and beautiful. So uh, at the first time, uh, in first we, we thought that this is Hagia Sophia, not the person. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, we, went, we, we we were confused, but really there, there are a lot of uh, mosques uh, like beautiful. Yeah. Now, I will admit the famous Blue Mosque is very close to the Hagia Sophia. And it can be somewhat confusing as long as you know there are two mosques, one that is known for being blue uh, could be a helpful hint. But that's why we're here, to provide the simplest of little travel nuggets for you when you make your way to Istanbul and wonder if I'm looking at the correct mosque or not. We are giving people life-changing hot tips here, Mike. So Colin, what grade are you giving our Polish friends here? Well, I feel like... Though these folks were great, uh, really enjoyed the conversation. I wanted to get some more from them, and I, I think the loudness of the fan fest kind of hindered that a little bit. So, again, this is not really a reflection of the people we talked with, but just really our interactions with them. So uh, we're rating ourselves here, I think, and I'm just going to have to go with a one for this one. Ouch. Poland, not in the pole position. But I tend to agree. It was a great place to meet people, not so much to hear them clearly, let alone record them. So I agree with the one, but still good people. And that leaves us with Saudi Arabia. Coming up next. All right, listeners, the final country in Group C, Saudi Arabia. I think some context will actually help us here. So 
Just hours prior to meeting with several Saudi Arabian fans, their team had just shocked the world and had arguably the biggest upset in World Cup history as they defeated Argentina. Uh, It was their first match. So needless to say, they were in high spirits and they were quite happy to talk to us. Yeah, the Saudis, along with much of the other Arab countries, were flying high that night. We met a handful of really friendly Saudis that we're going to share with you some of our exchanges with them. Uh, The first two were Ahmed and Ali, who were both from Riyadh. Obviously, we had to start with how they felt about their huge upset earlier that day. Uh, I can't explain my feeling. This is the best match in the history of uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, we're very, very, very happy. How about you? This is a very, very, very nice uh, match. I think, I didn't, I didn't believe that, you know, I, I, I <laughs> kind of I think unbelievable. that's maybe a dream. <laughs> dream worthy? <laughs> I, I think that. Yeah. Before the match, we, we hope it's a 1-1 yeah. or 0-0. It's big hope. But we win yeah. one that's, that's a great. I loved how humble they were saying before the match they were hoping for just a draw. That would have been a huge victory for them. And yet they beat Messi and company, which is just so big. And we asked them their thoughts on Messi. Is Messi as good as we think he is? Who is Messi? (laughs) Who is Messi? I don't know. I don't know. Apparently he played today. Now, the World Cups have often been defined by moments or plays, but I think this World Cup was even more so about memes. And one of the big memes at the start of the World Cup was people asking, who is Messi? Or where is Messi? Looking around, checking their pockets, it's kind of this cheeky burn for the for the goat, or maybe he isn't. Go check our reel on Instagram to see who people think actually is the real goat. But I, I enjoyed that the the meme world kind of started stirring up after the Saudi upset in the early stages of the the World Cup. Yeah, it was a it was a fun smack talk, but too early. Colin, you dropped some Arabic on us earlier in the episode. Could you maybe tell us a bit about how you learned it? Yeah, so. Our friend Ali actually teaches Arabic, and one of our favorite things to do when we arrive in a country is to make sure we know at least a few helpful phrases. Like any well-traveled person, it helps to be able to communicate a little bit wherever possible. So being in an Arabic country and talking with an Arabic teacher, you know, we had to ask for a few key phrases. So what would you say three words or phrases that I should learn in Arabic? Uh, Maybe, uh, salam alaikum. Like, hi. Okay. Okay. And uh, shukran. shukran. Thank you. Okay. And Polite words so far. And um, marhaba. Yeah. Marhaba. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Marhaba. And these phrases became part of our everyday lexicon during our time in Qatar and in my time in the UAE in Oman as well. Now, I wouldn't say I'm proficient in the Arabic language now, but I think it helped a little while we were in Qatar. And I wonder... If Ronaldo is going to require some Arabic classes in his coming months. Yeah, that mega contract offer from the Saudi club Al Nasir, maybe. And speaking of Saudi Arabia's involvement in global sports, we know they've been making some moves in golf, F1 racing, and in football. And Ahmed and Ali had some thoughts on the Saudi influence in the sports world and its future. Maybe maybe we are late, but we are coming. Coming, yeah. yeah. Fast coming, boy. Yes. Yeah. You are fast coming. Yes. We have fast vision. I think maybe after uh, before five uh, years, and now it's very very big. Still uh, Yeah, definitely. Yeah, very different. Five years, just five years. Wow. We're running with him, base. We're running. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You are. You're sprinting. <laughs> yes. yes. We also met some other Saudis that night at the Fan Fest named Mohammed, Abdul Aziz, Abdul Rahman, and they were equally as excited about the big win against Argentina. Uh, it's really amazing because we win a very big game, which is against Argentina. So we thought that Argentina, we're gonna, uh, Argentina we will be one of the teams which will go to the finals. So yeah, I, I mean, for us, it's really amazing. And I think the vibes is really good. One of the things that I found really interesting prior to the World Cup starting was reading that the second most ticket sales came from Saudi Arabia, which is really unique. But being the first World Cup in the Arab world, the excitement and ease of travel really attracted people who rarely travel for football to come to Qatar. And we saw this pretty extensively with fellow Arab countries supporting each other throughout the tournament. And so we asked these Saudis about that as well. 
why I came to Qatar? Because it's, it's a flight, one hour of life in Riyadh. And it makes sense. The world's biggest parties being held in your backyard. Why not make the quick flight or drive for some folks we met? They drove to Qatar to join in the fun. Right. I think that large influx of the Arab fan base in Qatar really helped their respective teams with loud, passionate supporters inside and out of the stadiums. And I think boosted those teams throughout the duration of the tournament. One of the storylines that I think has been kind of buried in this World Cup behind the bid and human rights controversy and unique differences of this tournament was the Arab world looked at this event as an opportunity to show the rest of the world what the Middle East is like and what it has to offer. Yeah, you could see that in what I'd say were pretty rampant Saudi Arabia and Jordan advertisements uh, in the airport, on billboards, um, constantly on television. It was kind of as if those respective tourism boards covered every part of Qatar in their promotion of their countries. But not only was it the marketing organizations, but also the locals. Like We were encouraged by people from Lebanon to Iran, Palestine to Jordan and beyond to come visit their country. And I would say the most promotional of the residents were the Saudis. Abdul Rahman, who lived in the US for a few years, took the opportunity to pitch his native country for visitors, inviting us to stay with him and the government funding international visitors trips to show them a good time. It became clear that the Saudis were proud of their country and were subtle extensions of their government's PR team, I think. Yeah, the self-promotion of their country was pretty assertive and obvious, uh, but they actually did a pretty good job of selling it. Kind of want to see for myself now what Saudi Arabia is all about. Don't tease the footy travelers with a good time internationally because we'll take you up on it. But not only was Rahman just a great salesman for his country, he might have made a even better salesman for the footy travelers or heck, part of the American soccer promotional team. I mean, he gave us easily the best quote of the tournament, in my opinion. So, and I want to take this opportunity to invite every uh, person in this app to love and watch football, which is soccer in the U.S. Football is more about, it's more than a game. It's about culture, about togetherness, about any yeah, more than the game. I got to say, when I heard him say this on recording, this whole quote made my heart flutter. It spoke to the core of the Footy Traveler's mission. And with that, along with our continued interactions with some of these lovely Saudis, that I would like to give our interaction with our friends from Saudi Arabia a score of three. I, I think they are very deserving of it. So hmm. I've put ourselves into a tie, a draw, if you will, between Mexico and Saudi Arabia. Now. Colin, can you uh, maybe help determine how we select a winner of this group? Do we do we go to penalty kicks? Do we go to fair play points? What do we do? Yeah, we've reached a, a tie in this scoring system. Um, you really couldn't pick a winner between Mexico and Saudi Arabia? No, I, I, I adore them both too much, Colin. I'm sorry. Well, if I was in your shoes, I'd uh, I'd ask myself which interaction left me feeling inspired or excited. And if I recall, following your conversation with Raul and Nina from Mexico, you were pretty jazzed up about it. So I'm just going to kind of remember your vibe from back then and, and say, Viva la Mexico. Viva la Mexico. The luchador mask seals the deal. Mexico wins Group C for the Footy Travelers World Cup Series. And I am fine with that. All right. And uh, with that, we have our third group winner determined and have five more groups remaining in our World Cup 2022 series. So stay tuned for our next group episode coming to you shortly. And remember to join the community. Follow us on Instagram, interact with our stories. We're going to be doing some polls on where we should head next, maybe. Check out our merch and share with friends. We appreciate and cherish every interaction. So until next time, be loud, be proud, and be good to each other. The Footy Travelers Podcast is a production of Fiper Media. To learn more about their other work, visit FiperMedia.com. That's F-Y-P-E-R Media.com. Our episodes are edited by me, Colin Martin. Mike Tyrone is our creative director. Cover art is by Felix Palau. 
Theme music comes from Shumatar, with additional music from Mr. Mastermind. Our incredible intro voice is Helen My Mars. You can keep up with all things footy travel by following us on Instagram, at footy travelers. We'll see you next time.